what do you see when you look at a plant? If you're an artist, you're gonna notice the way the light catches those petals, and you're gonna pick up a paintbrush. Think Claude Monet on a beautiful summer's day. If you're a farmer, you're gonna stare at that plant and wonder, what's it gonna be like next year? What are the seeds gonna be? And if you're a biochemist like myself, you're gonna to wanna to pluck that purple petal and take one of those green leaves and grind them up and figure out why they're different colors and why they do different things in biology. Now, when you all go home tonight and you probably tomorrow are raking leaves because you weren't raking leaves today, uh, you're going to think not one whit about the plants you're looking at. You may have a salad tonight at dinner or tomorrow morning or late some point during the day. Right? And that's usually what we think about plants. But I want to leave you with, I want to give you an idea. No plants, no civilization. Think back to the very beginnings of our society. Where did cities come from? It was when we began to plant crops to create agriculture. When we were first writing ideas down, right, we began with stone. We realized that was not a very good way to move around. Later on, we invented PDFs. But in between those two things, right, <laughs> There was paper, there was this archaic form of writing that we all still hopefully do from time to time, right? Moving these ideas through our society. Think about the clothes you're wearing, the cars you're driving are burning fossil fuels, plants, the houses we live in. No plants, no civilization. Now, plants are really fantastic factories, right? If I, if I had a bunch of seeds and I threw them out into a field and each of you is one of those seeds, and you're all in lines, so you must be a farm field or a rice paddy or something. What do you have to do? Right? You have to get out of your little seed shell, crack open, start growing roots, stems, leaves. You have to start capturing sunlight to make molecules that you're going to build more leaves with, et cetera, et cetera. Plants have another problem. They can't run and they can't hide, right? If a, if a caterpillar lands on your ear and starts chewing away at your ear, you can flick it off. You've never seen a plant take a, a, a leaf or a petal and do the same thing. So what they have to do is they have to rely on chemistry to make things that make them taste bad, right? And that's how they keep the caterpillar from eating their ear. Now, some things plants make still taste bad to us. Think broccoli and Brussels sprouts. but. Imagine garlic and onions and life without those compounds in those plants that give us those flavors. So plants have a lot to teach us about something very simple, chemistry, right? These are the ultimate do-it-yourselfers. You're dropped in place and you have to make everything necessary to survive, fend off things in the environment, and get to the next generation without ever moving. They're amazing factories. So when I look at a field of plants, right, I can see the beauty in that field of canola behind me, but when I think about what's going on in those, those leaves and in those flowers, there's the potential for making new chemicals or for taking chemicals plants already make and harvesting them. Thinking about plants as a source of fuels and a source of building blocks that we currently get out of petroleum. Right? We don't need to use petroleum for everything we, we, we do now. And can we get to a point where we can take what nature is showing us how to do and turn it to face a renewable and sustainable future? Now, 13 years ago, my wife and I were both working at a small startup company in the Bay Area in California. It, the company wasn't in Yosemite. It was actually in Hayward, which looks nothing like Yosemite. Um, but you know, we spent a lot of time wandering the beauty of California. And then an opportunity happened to come to St. Louis, right? So why do you leave California to come to St. Louis? Opportunity is one thing, but the opportunity was to take what I learned as a biomedical biochemist, right? Somebody who thought about drug design and to apply it to plants. Now, you may not realize this, but St. Louis has more plant biologists than anywhere in the world. And it's a fact because of big companies, small companies, big universities, smaller universities. Take a two hour drive away from St. Louis. You're in farm country. And it's that intersection of agriculture, industry, and academia that makes St. Louis a hotbed of plant biology. And thinking about plants as we know them, but also as we can start to, th to, to know them in the future. 
Now, this equation has come up earlier this morning. I'm phrasing it in a slightly different way. 7 plus 2 equals 9. This is the single greatest challenge to face by the next generation, our children and grandchildren. Two billion more people, another India and China in the space of the, by 2050. Now, it's two billion more people with hopes and dreams. It's two billion more people that are going to need food, water, clothes, fuel, health care, jobs, not to mention the impact that has on climate change. That's the challenge and the opportunity of the future. Now, there's a few ways you can approach this. You can throw up your hands and say there's nothing we can do about it. But I'm an optimist, right? Most scientists tend to be optimistic. Because if you think about humanity's track record, we've always found a way to improve our situation. It may not seem like it, but we are always doing that. And this extra two billion people really becomes an opportunity if you think about it in the right way. Now, nine years ago, that opportunity became, a, you know, challenge became very real when we had our daughter, right? Because it's in her lifetime those challenges are going to come to a crux. They're really going to be ahead of many different things. Now, as a professor down the street on the other side of Forest Park, I have a number of students in my classes. Right? They're graduating and heading out into the real world. By the time this challenge rises, they're going to be the future doctors, the scientists, the engineers, maybe the economists or the policymakers. I hope they're the scientifically educated policymakers. Right? <laughs> Because this is what we want and need. Now, they're the ones that are going to face it. You know, I'm going to be old and dead by the time 2050 comes around. But what I want to hope to do is leave a little bit in the world that's better than what I started with. Now, as a biochemist, right, what does that mean? I'm a molecular architect, and the people in my lab are also of the same way of thinking, right? So the spinning molecule, is a structure of a protein that we solved. My lab works in understanding what proteins look like. Now, the lower piece there, that double helix, is DNA. Right? If you think of DNA as the script for everything that happens in an organism, proteins are the actors, right? that little squiggly purple and blue thing at the top. Right? They're the ones that are the catalysts, which fits the title of our, our backdrop very nicely. Right? They're the, pro the molecules that are doing all the machines chemistry in a cell, they're the machines. Right? If you think about the Rube Goldberg design on this backdrop, right, each of the little pieces could be a protein in a pathway. And if you trigger something at one end, you're going to change things along those pathways. And my job as a, as, a, as a scientist is really to figure out how that happens at the basic level. But scientists and engineers like to tinker with things. Right? And as an architect, if I can understand the blueprint, I can go in and start to change it a little bit. I can add an extra bathroom here or take away something there. But the idea being, if we can sort of look at how nature does the processes it usually works with, can we start to manipulate them a little bit in our favor to make them better at what they do? And I'm going to share with you two examples from work from my lab, both individually and as a team with other labs, that really start to get at this idea of trying to take what we know about plants from the past and work them toward a future where they're really going to become the green factories of, of the next generation. So the first problem is one of environmental contamination. So imagine this field. These are fields um, in Japan. It's a farm field. It's fertile. It's really pretty. But keep in mind that as you move water through an ecosystem, you're moving metals, and sometimes toxic heavy metals, mercury, arsenic, lead, cadmium can accumulate somewhere. Maybe upstream of this town, there's a nickel smelting plant. And the metal that gets pulled out gets dropped in these fields, and they become poison. Does anyone want to make a guess at what the current state of technology is for cleaning up those fields? The dump truck. So imagine this room being your backyard that now is contaminated with lead. What we do is we dig up this entire room to about the depth of this stage, and we bury it in another field in containment. That is the technology we currently have. Because things like mercury and arsenic and lead are elements. You can't transform them into something that's safer. right? They're always there. 
the best you can hope to do is take them out of circulation and hide them somewhere. Now, what if there was a way that I could take that soil, pull the metals out, and instead of burying this whole room, maybe I just bury a trash can worth of material, right? A compactor. And plants offer a way of doing this. So this little scraggly plant here is called Arabidopsis thaliana. It's the lab rat of the plant biology world. But it's amazing, right? So what a plant's doing all the time is it's taking minerals, which are essentially metals, out of the soil and moving them up and distributing them to different parts of the plant, right? It's a processing factory. Now, occasionally, this plant will take in a toxic metal from the environment. It's a poison. So what it does is it makes that little Lego blocked molecule there in blues and yellows to bind that metal and store it away somewhere where it doesn't poison other things. And this happens all the time. There isn't a plant that's been looked at that doesn't have this sort of safety system. But the system can get overwhelmed if you're in soil that's really poisonous. But imagine that basic background ability to make this molecule to protect yourself and clean up those metals. What if I planted a, a field of plants that could now leach the metal out of the soil, I could collect them, burn them, right, turn them into ash, and bury the ash. I'm burying a small piece instead of the whole room. So what we set out to do about 10 years ago was to take that pathway that's naturally occurring, right, the, in the middle there you can see the plants growing on cadmium. They're not particularly happy, they have stunted roots, they're kind of shriveled. And we took the gene encoding the protein that makes that, that molecule that protects the plants. We engineered it a little bit and put it back into the plant, and now they can grow and survive on much higher levels of that metal. And they can actually leach it out of, out of, out of the um, soil. Right, so this is a proof of principle. That little plant is about this big, it's never gonna really save the world. But it really sets up the possibility for how you can take things that already exist and with really a very small change, improve that system that's already there. Now the second example deals with plastics. There have been a lot of plastic water bottles around today. How many of you recycled your water bottles? Be honest, raise your hands. Okay, you're one in 20. 95% of the plastic that gets made in the world never ends up in the recycling bins, it ends up in landfills, where it sits for about 500 years. But what if I told you there's a microbe, a bacteria from soil that can make a plastic that actually can be degraded safely? Now, if you've had a Target gift card in the last five years, played golf with a certain brand of golf tees, had a knee replacement, you've actually touched and held that biodegradable plastic that's made by a bacteria cell. So a company in Boston figured out how the bacteria do this, and they could put that bacteria into fermenters and grow up batches of biodegradable plastic. Now, unlike beer, which you can ferment a lot of and distribute around the world, right, you can't really make as much plastic in fermenters as you possibly could in other ways. So that company from Boston looked to St. Louis because of the expertise that are here in biochemistry and plants and agriculture and said, is it possible to take those genes from the microbe and move them into the plant? And so a few years ago, that was, I was part of a team that tried to do that. Now, the plant we used is this thing called Scamelina sativa. It's an oil crop, grows on marginal soils. It's a little bit like canola where we get most of our vegetable oil from. But we could take the genes from that microbe and put them into this plant and generate miniature factories. I did it before. Uh-oh. Okay. It did it, ah, going too far now. Okay. So what we could do is we could actually turn those plants into factories that could make plastics. So these little white blobs, this is an electron micrograph of a plant cell. All those white blobs are the polymer that you can then harvest and use to create materials from. So it's possible to turn these plants in a field into a plastics resource. And the plastic that gets made can basically be broken down in the space of a year if it ends up in a landfill because microbes eat that for energy sources. So those are just two examples of different things that we can start to do as scientists 
to make the world more sustainable and renewable. And it's just two examples from my own lab. Think about the number of plant scientists that are in a two-hour drive of, of where you're sitting now, and then go across the world. And we really ch face a challenge because there's opportunities. The first part is we can wave, toss our hands up and say, it's impossible, what can I do? And if enough people think like that, you end up with a world that looks a little bit like Venus, right? Carbon dioxide heavy, rain of sulfuric acid, really not the place you wanna raise your kids. But this is the world we know, this is the world we love. A childhood um, hero of mine was an Apollo astronaut, and it wasn't Neil Armstrong, it was a guy named Harrison Jack Schmidt. No one's probably heard of him. He's the only card-carrying PhD scientist to have gone to the moon. He was a geologist, and he was on the last moon mission. And he and Gene Cernan are on the surface, they're gathering rocks, and Gene says, Jack, look, the Earth is rising over the, the moon's horizon. Jack looks up, says, you've seen one Earth, you've seen them all, and goes back to gathering rocks. But that really simple statement, you've seen one Earth, you've seen them all, is what we always have to keep in mind in our daily lives and in whatever way that we as individuals can contribute to taking on that problem of those two billion extra people and trying to keep the world in the way that we know it and love it. So tomorrow, if you happen to go to the botanical garden or you're raking leaves and you're cursing the leaves because plants are clearly evil because they drop leaves everywhere and you have to rake them up, right? Ask yourself a really simple question. What do you want your children and grandchildren to see when they look at a, a flower? Now, hopefully they'll still see the beauty that's there, but with scientists working in how to make these organisms the next green factories, how to get us away from our dependence on petroleum and fossil fuels, and to teach us how to get to a sustainable, renewable future, the hope would be that they see the potential and the green factories in every plant that's out there. And thank you for spending the afternoon with us.